Crane. Grace. 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 All right, so we're picking up tonight in 2 Samuel chapter 16. And uh, now at the beginning of our journey tonight, David is right where we left him on the top of a mountain where he used to worship God. Uh, there he met um, uh, Hushai, who came to him at the very end of our last chapter, chapter 15, and he was mourning over the terrible events that led up to David's uh, flee from the palace in Jerusalem. Uh, these are the words. I'm going to go ahead and recap them real quickly. Uh, of that exchange, uh, which is a great lead-in to the first words we have in chapter 16, because the first words of chapter 16 talk about him being on on the summit with this guy. So it's best to remember that he was already on the mountain. So uh, in chapter 15, verse 31 uh, through 36, it says, Then someone reported to David, um, Othophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. Lord, David pleaded, please turn the counsel of Othophel into foolishness. And of course, we will see tonight that God did exactly that. Um, verse 32, when David came to the summit where he used to worship God, there to meet him was um, Hushai, the archite, with his robe torn and dust on his head. David said to him, if you will go away with me, you'll be a burden to me. But if you return to the city to tell Absalom that I will be your servant, my king, previously I was your father's servant, but now I'll be your servant, then you could can, uh, counteract Othophel's counsel for me. Won't Zadok and Abathar the priest be with you? Uh, be there with you? Report everything you hear to the uh, hear from the king's palace to Zadok and Abathar the priests. Take note, their two sons, Zadok's son of um, Amaz and Abathar's son Jonathan are there with them. Send me everything you hear through them. So that was where we left off last week. So now in chapter 16, starting verse 1, uh, with, uh, here's David again on the top of the uh, of that same mountain. It says, when David had gone a little bit beyond the summit, Ziba, Mephibosheth's servant, was right there to meet him. He had a pair of saddled donkeys loaded with 200 loaves of bread, 100 clusters of raisins, 100 bunches of summer fruit, and a skin of wine. The king said to Ziba, Why do you have these? And Ziba answered, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride, the, the bread and the summer fruit are for the young men to eat, and the wine is for those who become exhausted to drink, uh, become exhausted to drink in the desert. When, where is your master's son? the king asked. Why, he's staying in Jerusalem, Ziba replied to the king. For he said, Today the house of Israel will restore my father's kingdom to me. So if you remember, Mephibosheth was the one with the, the lame legs, and he was the grandson of Saul. And so Ziba here is trying to claim that as soon as David was kicked, uh, well, fled the kingdom, and um, and Absalom was coming in, that uh, that Mephibosheth just left his his uh, um, his uh, um, didn't want to use the word honor. That's that would be true as well. But his loyalties, that's it for um, to David, and ran back to the kingdom, hoping to have the kingdom restored to him. So this is what Ziba is telling him. So in verse 4 it says, The king said to Ziba, All that belongs to Mephibosheth is now yours. I bow before you, Ziba said. May you look favorably upon me, my lord the king. Now, picking up in verse, now in verse 5, uh, we're going to read about um, Shimei, uh, who winds up cursing David. Verse 5, When David, King David got to Barum, a man belonging to the family of the household of Saul was just coming out. His name was Shema, son of Gura, and he was yelling curses as he approached. He threw stones at David and all, and at all the royal servants, the people and the warriors on David's right and left. Uh, uh, Shimei said as he cursed, Get out, get out, you worthless murderer. The Lord has paid you back for all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you rule. And the Lord has handed the kingdom over to your son Absalom. Look, you are now, are you not, are you in trouble? I'm sorry. Look, you are in trouble because you are a murderer. And Abishai, son of Zeruiah, said to the king, 
Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over there and cut off his head. And the king said, replied, Son, Sons of Zariah, I mean, I'm saying Zeruah, do we disagree on any? Do we agree on anything? He curses me this way because the Lord told him, Curse David. Therefore, who can say, Why did you do that? Then David said to Abishai and his uh, and all his servants, Look, my own son, my own flesh and blood intends to take my life. How much more now, this Benjamite? Leave him alone and let him curse me. The Lord has told him to. Perhaps. The Lord will see my affliction and restore goodness to me instead of Shammai's curses today. Now, I'm not claiming that David handled this completely perfectly because I think that he's he's putting words in God's mouth that God clearly had not said. God did not tell this man to curse David. Um, but you know what? This is, again, one of the beauties of Scripture. And, you know, when I say stuff like this, it might not be a bad idea for you guys to take notes because... Uh, or at least make a mental note. Right there is a great example of why we have a reliability of the account that is given to us in Scripture. These things are being recorded at a time period when David was king, and instead of it smoothing over everything that David said that was wrong and turned out it wasn't really that way, and so they fixed it so David never looked like he said something wrong, they just let the record stand like it was. This is a great attestation to authenticity. Um, and and um, uh, people who study literature and and look into the authenticity and the reliability of documents, whether they script or scriptural or otherwise, pay particular note to things like that. You need to know that uh, another a great example that's on the negative end was um, just probably I guess now is more like ten years ago, but uh, they uncovered in one of the Egyptian tombs. Um, uh, they, there was plaster, what amounts to plaster Paris, if you will, on the inside of the tomb with the history that was written, but some of it was cracking and falling off, and they found that underneath it, there was a totally different rendition of the story underneath it. And someone, the next king, didn't like the way history had played out, so they plastered over it and rewrote history. And, uh, um, this is the way things happen, but in the Bible, the record just stands for what it is. Whether it sounds good for us or not, it just is what it is. And uh, so it's a, it's a great attestation to how reliable Scripture is. Now, um, going on with the thing about David, though, it, again, it fits real perfect with what we've been covering on Sundays. Particularly this last Sunday. Because what David is doing here, instead of defending himself, I mean, you, I mean, you, you can see right here, you've got a single guy coming out. Yeah, I get this picture of this crazy guy, you know, I mean, because he's, there's an army with David, and these are warriors. David alone is a warrior. And he's coming out spitting and cursing and throwing rocks and kicking up dirt and calling him a murderer and all these things. And, I mean, he's just asking to have his head removed from him. And, uh... And in fact, of course, that's one of the, uh, the the guys that was with David said, hey, just let me go kill the guy. I mean, why should he be running insults at you? And uh, But David does not defend himself. And again, we learned that about that on Sunday. Those who suffer wrongfully and bear it with patience and commit their soul to God in doing good, God is honored by this. And that person that does it winds up being blessed. That's what the scripture says. And that's exactly what David did here. Um, I mean, his conclusions were not completely right in assuming that God put these words in this man's mouth. But one way or the other, you can see that verse 12, he says, Perhaps the Lord will see my affliction and restore goodness to me instead of this man's curses today. What did he do? What's, what's he doing by doing that? He's committing his soul to God and doing good and leaving the judgment in God's hands. It wasn't like David did not have authority, God-given authority to do what he wanted right then. Uh, and God would not have removed that authority from him, even if he'd done something he shouldn't have done. But David deferred to God's judgment. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, one of the ones we read on Sunday, verse 21 through 25 says, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving, an, leaving you an example, so that you should follow in his footsteps. He did not commit sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. When reviled, he did not revile in return. David here did not revile. He didn't say, well, you know, you call me a name, I'm going to call you a name. He, he, didn't, he didn't retaliate. 
Um, when suffering, he didn't threaten. David had throw, stones thrown at him. And he didn't get off of his horse and kill the man or pick up stones and throw it back. He just received it and, and did nothing to defend himself and even wouldn't let his men defend him. It says, when reviled, Jesus didn't revile in return. When sufferings, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. David was already practicing this truth even under the old covenant. It's really quite... Uh, 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 a kudo for his behavior. Um, verse 13 now, back in, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 16, we're in verse 13 now. So David and his men proceeded along the road as um, uh, Shimei was going along, following them, the ridge of the hill opposite them. And as Shimei went, he cursed David and threw stones and dirt at him. Finally, the king and all the people uh, with him arrived exhausted, so they rested where they were headed. Now, verse 15 um, begins to talk about Absalom as he enters Jerusalem. So, verse 15. Now, Absalom and all the Israelites came to Jerusalem. Othophel was also with them. Now, remember, that's the guy that David just prayed. May the Lord turn the counsel of Othophel into foolishness. Because up to this point... Ophethel had been beside David and had offered good counsel, but then he defected and ran to his, whoever was, he was a political opportunist. Whoever was in power, he's who he wanted to get cushy with. So, um, so now Absalom and all of the Israelites came to Jerusalem and Oth Othophel, uh, was also with him. When David's friend, uh, Hushai, the archite, came to Absalom, and remember Hushai was the guy that, um, David spoke to on the top of the mountain and he sent him back there to be a spy for him. So it says, Hushai said to Absalom, long live the king, long live the king. Is your loyalty to your, is your, is this your loyalty that you show to your friend? Absalom asked, um, Hushai, why did you go, why didn't you go with your friend? Meaning, why didn't you go with David? Not at all, Hushai uh, answered Absalom. I am on the side of the one that the Lord, the people, and all the men of Israel have chosen. I will stay with him. Furthermore, whom will I serve if not his son? As I served in your father's presence, I will also serve in yours. Then Absalom said to Othophel, Give me your advice. What should we do here? Othophel re replied to Absalom, Sleep with your father's concubines that he left here to take care of the palace. When all of Israel hears that you have become repulsive to your father through this act, every one with you will be encouraged. So they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof, and he slept with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Verse 23. Now the advice of Othophel gave, now the advice Othophel gave in those days was like someone asking about the word from God. Such was the regard that both David and Absalom had for Othophel's advice. Now go on down to verse, uh, uh, chapter 17, starting in verse 1. So you can understand now why it was imperative that David sent um, Hushai there to counteract this man's counsel because David knew that this man's counsel usually turned out with great results. And so um, he needed someone that could be on the inside that would counter it and also be a spy. So now in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, Othophel said to Absalom, Let me choose 12,000 men, and I will set out in pursuit of David tonight. I will attack him while he is weak and weary, throw him into panic, and all the people with him will scatter. I will strike down only the king and bring all the people back to you. When everyone returns except the man you were seeking, all the people will be at peace. This proposal seemed good to Absalom and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, Summon Hushai, the archite, also. Let's hear what he has to say as well. So Hushai came to Absalom, and Absalom told him. Now, I want you to hold on. Just hold on to this fact, because of something we're going to read in a minute. Up to this point, remember, we just got done reading that Othophel's counsel was like the counsel of God, even to David and to Absalom. So, you know, traditionally, there would be no reason to go from the counsel of God to somebody else's counsel. You know what I mean? Why... Why, after hearing the best counsel in the land, would you summon someone else who you kind of suspect might still be on your dad's side, you know, um, for counsel? Why would you even do that? Well, we're going to read why in a little bit. 
Um, uh, it, this was directly by the hand of God. It says, uh, so in verse 5, Then Absalom said, Summon Hushai, the archite, also. And let's see what he has to say as well. So Hushai came to Absalom, and Absalom told him, Othophel offered this proposal. Should we carry out his proposal? If not, what do you say? Hushai replied to Absalom, The advice that Othophel has given this time is not good. Hushai continued, You know your father and his men. They are warriors and are desperate like a wild bear robbed of her cubs. Your father is an experienced soldier who won't spend the night with the people. He, he's probably already hiding in one of the caves or some other place. If some of our troops fall first, someone is sure to hear and say, there's been a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Then even a brave man with all with the heart of a lion will melt because all Israel knows that your father and the valiant men with him are warriors. Instead, I advise that all Israel from Dan to Beersheba, as numerous as the sands of the sea, be gathered to you and that you personally go into battle. Then we will attack David wherever we find him, and we will descend on him like the like dew on the ground. Not even one will be left of all the men with him. If he retreats to some city, all Israel who, uh, will bring ropes to that city, and we will drag its stones into the valley. Not even one pebble, can, where not even one pebble can be found there. Verse fourteen. This is the big one. This is the clincher. This is why you showed up tonight. Verse 7 to 14. Since the Lord had already decreed that Othophel's good advice be undermined in order to bring about Absalom's ruin, Absalom and all the men with him, uh, all the men of Israel said, this advice that Hushai the archite is better than Othophel's advice. Listen to that. The reason why Absalom even summoned Hushai in the first place to listen to what he said, and the reason why Absalom and the elders who were with him decided that Hushai's counsel was better than Othophel's was because God decreed that's the way it's going to turn out from his throne. He slammed down the gavel and said, this is what's going to happen. And so it happened. Now, this is what I've been telling you for years now. It was literally a vital piece of the puzzle that we lacked back in our Word of Faith days. God is both sovereign and arbiter. He alone rules over the affairs of men. If he decrees something, nothing can stop it. Period. Nothing. I mean, look at what happened here. Now, nothing in here tells us whether God suspended Absalom's free will or not. We don't know. It's actually more likely that God simply placed in the heart of Hushai a plan which God, in his complete understanding of us, knew that Absalom would bite. Uh, more than likely, that's what happened. But nonetheless, God still had to put it in Absalom's heart to call on Hushai in the first place. As you can see from what we read earlier, there was no reason for him to call Hushai. At this point, any wise person who just took the throne would be very cautious who they allowed among their top chief advisors. And a guy who just, who used to be um, his father's, you know, uh, right-hand guy, you wouldn't want that guy to be the one offering you advice. You'd listen, you might, you know, if he came to you and offer advice, you might weigh it in the balance, but you're not going to go seeking advice from him, not if you're smart. And nothing in nothing about Absalom, from what we've seen so far, indicates he's a stupid man. Um, he did what he did because God placed in his heart to do it. And this is this whole scenario was very, very much like what we're going to read when we finally get to First Kings chapter twenty-two, when God God arbitrated the fate of King Ahab from his throne. God made a decision; he knew it was time for Ahab to die because of the things he had done. And so he took counsel in heaven and, uh, and, and orchestrated an event that would cause King Ahab to go into battle and die. Um, all by God's decree. Now, I, so I'm, I'm really, gosh, I'm telling you, this is so very important that, you know, to me, this was the whole, this was the biggest reason for you to hear anything tonight. God literally has got 
the power alone to rule over the affairs of man. I don't care who's in power. I don't care who's struggling for power. You know, in today's world, we have, in American politics, it's nasty. We all know it's nasty. But, uh, and, and you know that all the sheep can be stirred up with money and with, uh, with other kind of things to do the looting and rioting and even killing people. But typically speaking, other than, you know, uh, typically speaking, leaders in government don't usually wind around go, going out personally killing people. They'll hire people, but they won't actually go do it. Back in David's day, there was no need to hire anybody. Anything you did, you did in plain sight and didn't care who knew about it. Um, there was no need for the cloak and dagger stuff back then. If you were against somebody, you just, you did what you could to kill them. And here's Absalom, David's own son, who has conspired against his father, divided his kingdom, and is now seeking to kill his father and rob his throne. Uh, so these are two people from the same house. And they're locking horns concerning the rulership of Israel. And uh, in the middle of all this, God's like, you know, I'm not concerned about this at all because what I say is still going to happen. You can do all your stuff. You can lock horns. You can get the biggest, you know, I mean, Absalom followed um, Hushai's advice and got all those, those warriors. I mean, we're talking about warriors from all of the rest of Israel going up against David and like 600 men. By sheer numbers, even if David's men killed um, a, a thousand or two thousand for every one that they killed, they still should have been able to wipe them out. David, in the natural, would not have stood a chance. And yet God, in his sovereignty and in his power, determined this is what's going to happen. Period. And once he slammed the gavel... That's the way the events on earth were going to play out, whether we wanted it to or not. So if this is the kind of power we're dealing with, the kind of God we're dealing with, do you really think a small thing like voting is going to get in God's way of putting the person he wants in power? Absolutely not. If God wants to do something, he will do it. And that's exactly what took place here. He was, I mean, when the Bible says that the, the, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and like the rivers of water, he turns it any way he desires. That's exactly what you just witnessed with Abathar. God turned Abathar's heart to consider counsel that he should have never in his right mind consider, followed after it, and it wound up being his destruction. And it's all because God determined this is what's going to happen. Now we're going to pick up now in verse 15. Hushai then told the priest Zadok and Abathar, because remember that was who David told him, whenever you find something out in the palace, you go back and you tell the priest, and the priest will let me know. So Hushai then told the priest Zadok and Abathar, this is what um, Othophel advised Absalom and uh, the elders of Israel, and this is what I advised. Now, send someone quickly and tell David, don't spend the night in the, at the wilderness ford of uh, the Jordan, but be sure to cross over, or the king and all the people with him will be destroyed. Jonathan and Am uh, um, I'm sorry, Amaz were staying at um, Enro Enrogel, I think that's right, uh, where a servant girl would come and pass along information to them. Then they would turn and go and inform the King David, because they dared not be seen entering the city. However, a young man did see them and informed Absalom. So the two left quickly and came to the house of a man in Burham. He had a well in his courtyard, and they climbed down into it. Then his wife took the cover, placed it over the mouth of the well, scattered grain on it, so nobody would know anything. Verse 20. Absalom's servants came to the woman at the house and asked, where is um, Amaz and Jonathan? They passed, uh, uh, they passed uh, by towards the water, the woman replied to them. The men searched but never found them, so they returned to Jerusalem. After they had gone, um, uh, Amaz and Jonathan climbed up out of the well and went and, uh, went and informed King David. They told him, get up and immediately... Um, uh, uh, essentially cross the river, for um, Othophel has given his advice against you. Verse 22, So David and all the people who were with them got up and crossed the Jordan. Uh, by daybreak, there was, not, there was no one who had not crossed the Jordan. 
When Othophel realized that his vice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown, because he already knew um, if what I said didn't work, or if it failed, or if the king decided not to listen to me, I'm, I'm a, as good as a dead man. So when Othophel realized that his vice had not been followed, he saddled his donkey and set out for his house in his hometown. He set his affairs in order and went out and hung himself. So he died and was buried in his father's tomb. Verse 24. David had arrived in May Mayanam by the time Absalom crossed the Jordan with all the men of Israel. Now Absalom had appointed Amasa over the army in jo um, Joab's place, because you remember Joab was David's uh, military commander. Um, Amasa was the son of a man named Ithra in Israel. Ithra was married to Abigail, daughter of Nahash. Uh, Abigail was the sister of Zeruah. Now, remember, Zeruah was the guy who said, hey, can can I just cut this guy's head off for insulting you, David? That's his sister we're talking about. Abigail was the sister of Zeruah, Joab's mother. And Israel and Absalom camped um, in the land of Gilead. Verse 27, when David came to uh, Mahanam, um, Shobi, son of Nahash from Rabbah, of the Amorites, or Ammonites, I'm sorry, uh, Micar, son of Amiel, uh, from Lodabar, and Barzia, or Bar Barzile, I guess it's Barzile, Barzile, something like that, the Gilead, uh, from Roglam, brought beds, basins, and pottery items. They also brought wheat, barley, flour, roasted grain, beans, lentils, honey, curds, sheep, and, sh and cheese for, um, uh, from the herd for David, and the people who were with him. They had reason the people must be hungry, exhausted, and thirsty in the desert. Now, chapter 18. This is where Absalom dies. Chapter 18, starting verse 1. David reviewed his troops and appointed commanders of hundreds and of thousands over them. He then sent out the troops, one-third uh, one third under jo uh, Joab, one-third over under Joab's brother Abishai, son of Zeruah, and one under... Um, Atai the Gittite. The king said to the troops, I will march out with you. You must not go, the people pleaded. If we have to flee, they will not pay attention to us. Even if half of us die, they will not pay attention to us, because you are worth ten thousands of us. Therefore, it is better that you support us back in the city. I will do whatever you think best, the king replied to them. So he stood beside the gate while all the troops marched out by hundreds and by thousands. Verse 5, the king commanded Joab, Abishai, and Atai, treat the young man Absalom gently for my sake. In other words, don't kill him. All the people heard the king's order to the commanders about Absalom. Then David's forces forced uh, marched into the field to engage Israel in battle, which took place in the forest of Ephraim. The people of Israel were defeated by David's soldiers, and the slaughter there was, was vast that day. 20,000 casualties. The battle spread over the entire region, and <clears throat> that day the forest wound up claiming more people than the sword. Absalom was, right, uh, was riding on his mule when he, when he happened to meet David's soldiers. When the mule went under, uh, went under the tangled branches of a large oak tree, Absalom's head was caught fast in the tree. If you remember, Absalom had a lot of hair. He caught it once, cut it down to nothing once a year, shaved his head once a year, and what he shaved off every year weighed five pounds. So the guy, the guy could grow some hair. So um, his hair got stuck in, um, in the tree, and he essentially was hanging by his own hair. So it says, when the mule went under, under the tangled branches of the large oak tree, Absalom's head was caught fast in the tree. The mule under him kept on walking, so he was suspended in midair. One of the men saw him and informed Joab. He said, I saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Verse 11. You just saw him? Joab exclaimed. Why did you not strike him to the ground right there? I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a belt. The man replied to Joab, Even if I had the weight of a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not raise my hand against the king's son. For we heard the king's command to you, Abishai and Atai, Protect the young man, Absalom, for me. If I had jeopardized my own life and nothing is hidden from the king, you would have abandoned me on the spot. Joab said, I'm not going to waste my time with you. 
Then he went and took three spears in his hand and thrust them into Absalom's heart while he was still alive in the oak tree. And ten young men who were with Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Verse 16. Afterwards, Joab blew the ram's horn, and the troops broke off their pursuit of Israel because Joab restrained them. They took, uh, they, uh, took Absalom, threw him into a large pit in the forest, and piled a huge mound of stones over him, and all Israel fled, each to his tent. Verse 18. When he was alive, Absalom had erected for himself a pillar in the king's valley, for he said, I have no son to preserve the memory of my name. So he gave the pillar his name. It is still called Absalom's Monument today. Verse 19. Now this is where David hears about his son's death. Um, Amaz, son of Zadok, said, Please, let me run and tell the king the, new, the good news that the Lord has delivered him from his enemies. Joab replied to him, You are not the man to take good news today. You may do it, uh, may, you may do it another day, but today you aren't taking good news because the king's son is dead. Joab then said to the Cushite, Go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed to Joab and took off running. However, Amaz, son of Zadok, persisted and said to Joab, No, no matter what, please let me run too behind the Cushite. Joab replied, My son, why do you want to run since you won't get a reward? No matter what, I want to run. Run then, Joab said to him. So um, Amaz, son, uh, I'm sorry, Amaz ran by way of the plain and outran the Cushite. David was sitting between the um, the two gates. That's where he started. Remember, that he stayed at the gates while the men went to war. He was sitting between the two gates when the watchman went up uh, to the roof of the gate uh, and over the wall. The watchman looked out and saw a man running alone. He called out and told the king. The king said, if he's alone, he bears good news. As the first runner came closer, the watchman said, another man is running. He called out to the gatekeeper, Look, another man is running alone. The, this one also brings good news, said the king. The watchman said, The way the first man runs looks to me like the way um, Amaz, son of Zadok, runs. This is a good man. He comes with good news, the king commended, uh, com com commented. Um, Amaz called out to the king, All is well. And then he bowed down to the king with his face to the ground. He continued, May the Lord your, your God be praised. He delivered up the men who rebelled against my Lord, the king. The king asked, asked is the young man Absalom all right? Um, Amaz reported, When Joab sent the king's servant to your, serv uh, to your servant, I saw a big disturbance, but I, do not, but I don't know what, what, what it was, which was a lie. He knew what happened. Um, verse 30, The king said, Move aside and stand here. So he stood to one side. Just then the Cushite came and said, My lord the king, um, I said, May the lord the king, um, I guess, hear the good news. Um, uh, I, mine says heart. I'm not sure why. Maybe it was a misprint. Uh, I have to get rid of that. Anyway, so may you hear the good news. Today the lord has delivered you from all those rising up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom all right? The Cushite replied, May what has happened uh, become of the young man happen to the enemies of my lord the king and to all who rise up against you with evil intent. Which was just a long way of saying your son's dead. Verse 33, The king was deeply moved and went up into the gate chamber and wept. As he walked, he cried, My son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom. If only I had died instead of you, Absalom, my son, my son. Ver uh, chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Um, it was reported to Joab, the king is weeping. He's mourning over Absalom. Now, let me let me just stop there real quickly before we go any further. I, I remember when I was in college, um, one of my professors uh, uh, brought this up about this situation. You know, when people who uh, who have uh, you know sinned or maybe have had a pattern of sinning in their life, and they come to themselves and they run to the Lord and they they ask for forgiveness and uh, they, they they question, you know, whether or not God will hear them or God will forgive them because of the multitude of their sins. You know, they said, you know, you, the heart of this man, David, who is a man after God's own heart, is not greater than God's. And his own son conspired against him, committed treason, divided his kingdom, and sought to kill him. And at his death, instead of 
of rejoicing over the death of his son, he, he wept and he cried and said, if only it had been me that died. He said, you know, this is, this is, that's the heart of an earthly man. Um, how much greater the heart of God for one of his children. So, and I totally agree with that. Now, of course, we do know that if a person continues in treason long enough and they will not change, though God goes after their heart many, many times, they can come to the point of apostate. But, uh, uh, it doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't happen quickly. God loves his children, um, and he weeps over them. So in chapter 19, starting in verse 1, it says, It was re reported to Joab, the king is weeping. He's mourning over Absalom. That day's victories, well, victory was turned into mourning for all the troops, because on that day the troops heard that the king is grieving over his son. So they returned to the city quietly. That day, like people coming uh, coming in when they are humiliated after fleeing in battle. But the king hid his face and cried out at the top of his voice, My son Absalom, Absalom, my son, my son. Then Joab went into the house of the king and said, Today you have shamed all of your soldiers. Now remember, I've told you the nature of the relationship that Joab and David had. That It was a tenuous relationship at best. They butted heads quite a bit. And this day, Joab's going to lose his job over it. But um, it's my opinion, based on all that we know from the Lord and things that we've read in the past, particularly when the priest in the in the wilderness, um, his two sons were killed by the Lord, and he said, don't weep for them. I believe that Joab's counsel was right here, and I think David was dead wrong. But it says, verse 5, says, Joab went into the, out of the house of the king and said, Today you have shamed all of your soldiers, those who rescued your life and the lives of your sons and daughters, your wives and your concubines. You, uh, you love your enemies and hate those who love you. Today you have made it clear that the commanders and the soldiers mean nothing to you. In fact, today I know that if Absalom were alive and all of us were dead, you would be fine with, it would be fine with you. Now get up. Go out and encourage your soldiers, for I swear by the Lord, if you don't go out, not a man will remain with you tonight. This will be worse for you than all the trouble that has come to you from all, from your youth all the way up until now. Again, I believe this was very good word from Joab, and he was just the guy to deliver it. Not too many people would have gone up in front of the king like that, but Joab had the kind of past with David that allowed him uh, to to say what was needed to be said. And when you've got a military leader under your command and your cabinet, if you are a leader of, an, of a nation, it's important that they've got the freedom to speak their mind. They've got to have that freedom if you expect to win, if you expect to continue to, uh, to go forward. And he's telling them right now, you know what I'm telling? If you don't do this, all the men are going to eventually leave you. Um, so picking up now in verse 8, David returns to Jerusalem. So the king got up and sat in the gate, and all the people were told, Look, the king is sitting in the gate. Then they all came into the king's presence. Meanwhile, each Israelite had um, fled to his tent. All the people among all the tribes of Israel were arguing, The king delivered us from the grasp of our enemies, and he rescued us from the grasp of the Philist Philistines, but now he has fled from the land because of Absalom. But Absalom, the man we anointed over us, has died in battle. So why do you say nothing about restoring the king? Verse 11, King David sent word to the priests Zadok and Abathar. Say to the elders of, of Judah, why, do you, uh, why should you be the last to restore the king to his palace? The talk of all Israel has reached the king at his house. You are my brothers, my flesh and my blood. So why should you be the last to restore the king? And tell Amasa... Aren't you my flesh and blood? May God punish me and do severely, do so severely if you don't become commander of the army from now on instead of Joab. I don't believe that was a good choice. Verse 14. So he won over all the men of Judah, and they sent word to the king, Come back, you and all your servants. Then the king returned. When he arrived at the Jordan, Judah came to Gilead, I'm sorry, Gilgal, uh, to meet the king and escort him across the Jordan. David, won, this right here, verse 16 through the end, pretty much is where David winds up parting, uh, um, pardoning all of his enemies. Verse 16, Shimei, son of Gera, that's that guy that was shouting all the insults at David and throwing stones, a Benjamite uh, from uh, Burham, um, hurried down with the men of Judah to meet the king. There are 1,000 men of, uh, from Benjamin with him. Ziba, an attendant from the house of Saul, 
with his 15 sons and 20 servants also rushed um, down to the Jordan ahead of the king. Now remember, Ziba was the one that had put words in um, Mephibosheth's mouth. Uh, he slandered him, uh, trying to say that he did something he didn't do. Uh, verse 18, and remember, uh, in a reply, David gave to Ziba all of the the, the homestead of uh, and the possessions of Mephibosheth. So um, he, when he found out David had won, he ran down there along with uh, the household of Saul and 15 of his sons and 20 of his servants and rushed down to the Jordan ahead of the king. Verse 18, they uh, forded the Jordan uh, to bring the king's household across and do whatever the king desired. When Shemai, son of Gura, crossed the Jordan, he fell down before the king and said to him, My lord, don't hold me guilty, and don't remember your servant's wrongdoing on the day my lord the king left Jerusalem. May the king not take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. But look, today I am the first one of the entire house of Joseph to come down and meet my lord the king. Abishai, son of Zeruah, um, um, Zeruah asked, Shouldn't Shemai be put to death for this? Because he ridiculed the Lord's anointed. David answered, Sons of Zeruah, um, um, sorry, Zeruah, do we agree on anything? Remember, that's what he said earlier when they first wanted to chop his head off. Have you become my adversary today? Should any man be killed in Israel today? Am I not aware that today I'm king over Israel? So the king said to Shemai, you will not die. Then the king gave him his oath. Mephibosheth, Saul's grandson, also went down to meet the king. He had not taken care of his feet, trimmed his mustache, washed his clothes from the day that the king left until the day that he returned safely. That, by the way, was a type of mourning. Um, verse 25. When he came to Jerusalem, he met the king, and the king asked him, Mephibosheth, why didn't you come with me? My lord, the king, he replied, my servant Ziba betrayed me. Actually, your servant said, I, I saddled the donkey for myself so that I may ride it and go to the king, for your servant is lame. Ziba slandered your servant to my lord, the king. But my lord, the king, is like the angel of God, so do whatever you think is best. For my grandfather's entire family deserves death from my lord, the king. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. So what further right do I have to keep on making appeals to you, the king? Verse 29, the king said to him, why keep on speaking about these matters of yours? I hereby declare that you and Ziba are to divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Instead, since my lord the king has come to his palace safely, let Ziba take it all. Barzila, the Gileadite, had come down from Roglam, or yeah, Roglam, um, and accompanied the king to the Jordan uh, to the Jordan River to see him off at the Jordan. Uh, Barzilla was uh, a very old man, 80 years old, and since he was a very wealthy man, he had provided for the needs of the king while he stayed in um, Mahanam. The king said to Barzilla, or Barzilla, uh, cross over with me and I'll provide for you at my, uh, um, by my side at Jerusalem. Barzilla replied to the king, how many years of my life are left? That I, may sh that I should go up to Jerusalem with the king. I'm now 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant even taste or eat what he drinks? Can I hear the voice of male and female sing singers? Why should your servant be an, ad an added burden to my lord the king? Since your servant is only going with the king a little way across the Jordan, why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please, let your servant return, so that I may die in my own city near the tomb of my father and my mother. But here is your servant um, Shimham. Let him cross over with my lord the king. Do for him what seems good to you. The king replied, Shimham will cross over with me, and I will do for him what seems good to you. And whatever you desire from me, I will do for you. Verse 39. So all the people crossed the Jordan, and the king crossed. The king um, kissed Barzilla and, and blessed him, and Barzilla returned to his own home. The king went uh, on to Gilgal, and Shimham came, uh, went with him. All the troops of Judah and half of Israel escorted the king. Suddenly, all the men of Israel came to the king. They asked him, Why did our brothers, the men of Judah, take you away secretly and transport the king and his household across the Jordan along with the, uh, um, David's men? 
they were essentially jealous. They were all vying for, you know, brown nosing it before the king. Uh, verse 42, all the men of Judah responded to the men of Israel, because the king is our relative. Why does this make you angry? Have we ever eaten anything of the kings or been honored at all? So in other words, saying we did what we did because he's our relative, not to get something from him. Verse 42, uh, 43, the men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king, meaning in other words, 10 tribes. Um, so we have a greater claim to, uh, to David than you do. Why then do you despise us? Weren't we, the first, uh, weren't we the first to speak of restoring our king? But the words of the men of Judah were harsher than the men of those of the men of Israel. And it just leaves us hanging there. So uh, that was the, the story of Absalom and the division of the kingdom and they're being restored back to David. And we learned a lot of things. David did not handle a lot of these things well, and he also handled a lot of them right. Uh, meaning, hey, he was human. And uh, God doesn't hide any of that from us. He just says, hey, this is the, the way it worked. But uh, again, a particular note that was extremely important was two things. David, when he was, uh, really three things. David, uh, when he was uh, being cursed at and stones thrown at him, he did not retaliate. Even though he had every right politically and every other way, because God had delegated him complete authority over Israel, he could have killed the man, um, somewhat with impunity. Uh, but he didn't do it. Uh, he just passed judgment to the hands of God. So that's a huge deal. Uh, number two, he forgave his enemies. The very guy who cursed at him, spat at him, threw rocks and dirt, he forgave. And um, uh, and then and one of the reasons he did it, by the way, it it shows up in the text, but it may not be something that comes out like we the neon light on it, so you may not pick up on it. But David was saying, "Why should any man in Israel die today?" And you'll notice in times in the past, whenever the Lord would give them victory, often that was the de the declaration that you know this is not a di a day for any of Israel to die. So enough people have died today. God has granted us victory. No one else is going to die. And so that was his decree. The last thing, of course, was God's sovereign power to arbitrate concerning the affairs of man. Uh, and it was done, at least in part. God had already decided David was going to be king. And God had already made the declaration that he would remain on the throne. Uh, so God was probably going to do this anyway. But if you remember the very, very beginning of our reading tonight in chapter 16, um, and actually 15, um, David, when he went to the summit of the mountain where he met with uh, um, Hushai, he cried out to the Lord and asked that um, Othophel's um, uh, counsel be counted as foolishness, be turned into foolishness before Absalom, so that he wouldn't follow it. And in the end, that's what wound up happening. Um, that's why Othophel killed himself. Uh, but it said that the Lord had already decreed that they should not listen to the counsel of Othophel, but um, so that the king would go into battle and die there. God had already decreed that was going to happen. So that's the way things played out. So those are three big, 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 big takeaways for tonight. So um, hopefully that's going to stick with you. And they offer, they serve as great examples of God ruling in the affairs of man. God does give men meaning mankind, a, um, a tremendous amount of latitude to the left or the right to do as they see fit, even if it's against his will, even if he hates what they're doing. But if it tap dances or even comes anywhere close to encroaching upon God's plan, what he had purposed to have accomplished, We've seen repetitively already since Genesis, God is not only capable, but he will make his plan come to pass regardless of what it takes. He's going to make it happen. And so we should take heart. Even in today's world, even with the political upheaval that we are surrounded by, you know what? Nothing's going to happen unless it's decreed from God. In the end, the person who rules, God placed them there. That's what scripture says. So, uh, so I, I open it up now. If anybody has any comments or thoughts that they'd like to share or questions they'd like to ask, please go right ahead. I just uh, uh, pressed the button to unmute you, uh, Nancy. But in the meantime, while we're figuring that out, Pam is asking a question. So go ahead, Pam. Um, yeah, and tonight, 
to today's time. Uh, and the atmosphere and the corruption, uh, we believe that God appointed Trump for this time. Yeah. But we don't know for how long. No, we don't, unless God tells us, which he's got the right to do that. But, uh, uh -huh. but he hasn't told me one way or the other at this point. Um, I could easily see it going either way, um, though I, I believe he's probably going to uh, put Trump in a second um, term. But just because even if he does go in, it doesn't mean that he's going to live out the entire term. We just don't know how things are going to play out. Yeah. I mean, there's enough people yeah. against that man that uh, if God was not protecting his life, he'd already be dead. Yeah. There's no question about it. I mean, because they're angry enough to murder, and to these people, murder is nothing. So, um, uh, so I, I know that God's hands on him, and he's not done with him, at least not yet, as far as in his life and as far as leader of the nation. But no, I don't have any insight one way or the other. I know there's been a number of people that claim to be prophets who have, uh, have made declarations um, that Trump will serve two terms, and they may be right. Uh, I don't know. God's not told me. And I don't really care, to be honest with you, because whoever's in there is the person God wants. That's all I care about. So what do I care who's there? So, uh, but yeah, um, I don't know. Well, I, I, just, I just, my prayer today was to not let America die that way. But, in other words, if Trump does not get reelected and the, the extreme left does, um, you know, it still all goes, has to all go back to trust. Yes, it does. And we... And as, that's, a, that's, that's a big deal. <laughs> well, we as children of God have got to keep it in our hearts and our minds that our only kingdom is God's kingdom. I'm... I'm I'm a physical citizen, natural born citizen of America, but that is not my home. I'm, I'm, I'm as much a stranger here as someone who were to come fresh from New Zealand. I, I, I'm, I'm a sojourner. I don't belong here. And the affairs of man have little to do with me. I don't care what they do. Uh, what I care about is the, the furtherance of the kingdom of God. If that takes the destruction of America, then I pray it's destroyed today. If it doesn't require the destruction of America, then let it stick around. Um, uh, either way, it literally makes no difference to me. Um, I believe with all my heart that before the end, there will be no America. Um, it's not mentioned in the book of Revelation at all as a major player. And because of the kind of world power that America is right now, if we were around when those events took place, I guarantee we would have been mentioned. And we're not mentioned at all. Which tells me we will be disbanded long before the end. Um, when that's going to happen, I don't know. Uh, there's been a lot of prophecies that have said that America is going to divide. And if it does divide, it will no longer be United States. It will be fractured states. It, America will very likely begin to look like Europe. With little, you know, states that are their own sovereignties, um, which is going to make things very interesting as far as trade and, uh, and as far as uh, um, protection of individual borders. It's going to be, it, we're going to be looking to Europe for some advice uh, because we've never had that in this nation. We've all been unified on one continent. Uh, if we become divided, it's going to be an interesting thing. So, but one way or the other, this isn't my kingdom. I'm not saying by that that I don't care about America and I don't care about Americans. And I'm certainly not saying that I don't honor and respect those that have, you know, served and given their lives for our freedoms. I'm not in any way playing that down. That is, when, I, when it comes to that, I'm very patriotic. But as far as making it a major concern of mine as to whether or not our nation continues in its sovereign state that it's in right now is not a concern of mine. 
Um, my concern is the church, the body of Christ, meaning, I mean, our church, of course, but the body of Christ and the kingdom of our Lord and the rest of it is at least a far second, if not third, in realm of importance. So, You know, uh, going through the Old Testament like we are and things we've learned about God and, and you know, when he, especially when he moves people out, uh, killing everything and everybody, mm -hmm. give, having given them time to seek him and, and run to him. Yeah. Um, I, I look at that now and I look at the church and I look at the people. Mm -hmm. And while we're, I'm pretty sheltered, I think, uh, as far as what I know goes on in the world. Mm -hmm. But um, it's, it's, it's like... Um, are people crying out? You know, are we seeking? Mm -hmm. um, well, or are we going to be like the Ammonites? <laughs> yeah. Is, well, is, that, is that right? Well, in a way, it depends on what you mean. If by we you mean the church, no. God is not going to order the destruction of his church. Um... Is it possible that God may order the destruction of America? Absolutely. Yes. It's, it, I not only believe it's possible, I'm in my own heart completely certain it's going to happen. Whether it would happen, I don't know whether it's going to happen in my lifetime or 10 lifetimes from now or, or what, but I'm, I, I'm personally satisfied that that's exactly what's going to have to take place. Um, but, uh, um, you know, but, no, the church would not be. Um, God might allow, it, with his people, what he does is he allows his people, if they will not repent, he allows them to be taken into captivity. But he doesn't destroy them. He destroys the world and gives them a place. But there again, we have to be a little careful. So this is a good question. We have to be careful and not blend covenants. Um what God was doing in the earth with Israel required that they have a physical land. That was important. For the church, it is not important. In fact, there are several statements in the New Testament that talk about how, and it's even prophesied in the Old Covenant, it calls us a foolish people. The word foolish doesn't mean we're silly or stupid. It means we're a nation without having a continent. Um, you can go down the road and find five Christians and you can cross the ocean and find, uh, you know, a, a million Christians, cross the other ocean and find, you know, two million Christians. And we all belong to the same nation. It's a silly nation. It's not an earthly nation. That's what the Bible means by that. Mm -hmm. Um, and so our, uh, um, our affiliation is not with physical domains. And so, um, uh, if even if the church is doing what it should do, doesn't mean that America will still be here. I mean, uh, the, nothing in the scripture says that if Christians do what they're supposed to do, he will make sure whatever nation they're living in keeps on prospering. Doesn't say that. So, um, you know, it, we have to be careful, you know, superimposing promises from the old covenant on the new because God's not doing now what he was doing then. Does that make sense to you? But me? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, did anybody else have, or even Pam, anybody, does anybody else have something else? Mark, I've got a, a, I guess in a way, a question. Sure. Along with what Pam was saying. She said, are people crying out? And I guess, you know, and then what you were saying about with the people, uh, and, and God sparing the nation, so forth. Should we really be ask, asking ourselves as well as, you know, in regards to the church as a whole, are mm -hmm. we living out? Yeah, that's the big deal. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean our because... cry needs to be, we need to be doing what everybody loves. All Christians seem to love that passage taken out of context in Second Chronicles. We all need to be, we all need to be doing what that says, but you need to be expecting a different result than what God was giving. The land God's going to heal is his people. Right. It's not, he didn't promise I'm going to heal the physical land you happen to be living in. 
Uh, and and even even if he did mean that, like I've told you, uh, I don't know how many times up to this point, um, uh, the the healing of the land that he did was not healing them of bad leadership. In order for that prayer to even be answered, they had to have good leadership. Um, he was going to heal them from blight and from plagues and from pestilence and from war. But he was not going to to um, restore godly leadership to them just because the people said, oh, we feel bad, give us a good leader. Um, that's not what that promise was even made for. So, um, but yeah, we ought to, like Doris is saying here, we ought to, our biggest concern is to make sure that the kingdom of God, that the people of God are subject to their king, who our real king is, which is Jesus. And, and as you uh, said, Sunday, that I surrender all, do we? Yeah. It's not easy. <laughs> No, it doesn't. It's not. And that's one of the things we're dealing with on Sunday is the, the harder things in the Christian faith. Uh, the harder things are the things that slip under the radar. You know, it's, 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 it's actually easier for a child of God to put on their mask and live out Christianity when they're out in the public than it is to keep from saying things and reacting poorly in home. And that yes. is the very reason why the scripture points to the home. If you can't do it there, God's like, you know what? I don't even receive it if you're trying to do it someplace else. The biggest thing is that you're doing it in your home. And uh, and that's where suffering is going to be probably the most pronounced for most Christians. And so if we can't live our Christianity and Jesus is my king in my home, well, then I'm really not living it at all. I'm just, I'm just kidding myself. Um, so do, do you think... This is just an opinion I'm sure I'm asking. In regards to all that's been taking place over the last few months with, you know, the stay at home, the shutdown, the stay at home, et cetera, that it's giving people more opportunity to get their homes oh, yeah. straightened out and, and, you know, right? Yeah. Especially with those who are believers. I mean, if you're a non believer, it's not going to make much difference. You, no. you get depressed, you may, whatever, you could really go off the deep end. Yeah, I Which mean, it's happened with a number of people, but it's I think it's an opportunity for people to just say, hey, you know what? We've forgotten about the foundation of the that's family. That's right. Yeah. And my, yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. I don't know whether or not God sponsored it, but he's definitely using it uh, because the fact that it begins at the house in the home. And, uh, you know, if there's anybody that should be almost completely unaffected by this entire thing, it's Christians. This should be like water off a duck's back to us. Um. Uh, but, you know, some of the greatest complainers I've heard are Christians. And I'm like, you know what? We are not being a good testimony to the world. You know, if we can't even handle, I mean, it's not like people are going through the streets lining us up and shooting us. They just said, stay home and put a, 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 you know, a piece of paper over your mouth if you go out in public, which is as silly as the world is. But, you know, that's what they tell you to do. So, I mean, just do it and, and get on with life. Um, it's It's not the end of the world. This is, this is... We really are playing around in the kitty end of the pool. If we can't handle this, God help us. If we ever get true persecution in this land, we are such uh, just babies in this nation. We can't handle a splinter. It's astounding how how weak we are. And uh, most of the world would look at us and just think, you know, God, those guys are just babies. And, and they're right. We are. We are largely infantile in the way we handle things. Um, you know, we, we should pull up by the bootstraps and realize, you know what? Nothing about this kicked Jesus off the throne. Nothing of substance um, has changed. Nothing is going on today. The 10,000 years from now, I'm going to care the slightest bit about. So why am I allowing my entire world to be rocked? It doesn't make sense. I'm declaring Jesus isn't Lord. I'm declaring that the government's Lord and that what rules me and rules my emotions and rules my how I feel and how I react is what the government tells me. Well, then I'm acting like the government's my home, like America's my home, and it's not. So, uh, yeah, these things are very, very important. And it's a God will put us in crucibles to burn off the dross and bring out the gold. So it's a good attitude to approach this time with. That you know what um, we're going to allow this to refine us, and we're going to live godly lives, um, because God's you know tighten the screws down a little bit, 
Let's just reveal what's in the heart and deal with it. If what's in the heart is nasty and terrible, don't become disheartened. Just say, you know what, God kind of thought that was probably in there. Now I know for a fact, so let's deal with it. You know, just like I shared with you guys earlier this past year, things that I've had to deal with here in this home, um, I've had to do that quite a few times. And God has been so gracious to put triggers in my mind before things happen so that now I can honestly say before the Lord, my successes are many higher than uh, my failures. I still fail, uh, definitely. And when I do, I generally feel pretty good. Um, but uh, at the same time, the successes are getting greater. And it's not because of Mark. It's always so obvious, even to me. I'm so humbled when it happens that, oh my gosh, wow, God, thank you. Because, wow, if you had not been right there, if you had not just been speaking to my heart before that happened, I would have blown up. And you saved me from myself. Thank you. You know, that's all that's left to say is thanks. <laughs> you know, because it's all him if you succeed. So, uh uh, any other thoughts? This is good stuff. Any other uh, thoughts or questions or statements that we have? Anyone? Am I being heard now? Yes, you okay. are. Yes, okay. you are. I think I'm just got three things I want to say, and then I'm going to do it quickly. That's I think fine. I get what Pam under uh, Pam was trying to say on being um, shielded, because I don't listen to all this junk that's. Uh, coming across. Of course, we're exposed to all this political stuff, but I really don't pay attention to it. Yeah. So a lot of times people say, well, did you? Well, no, I didn't hear. Mm -hmm. So, but I think, yeah, we are sheltered. And sometimes I wonder if we shouldn't have more information to pray about. Mm -hmm. You know, so I've, I've had mixed emotions on what to listen to and what not. Mm -hmm. But, um, we can always pray in the spirit. That's true. And um, the other, the other thing is, with what we've gone over tonight, it's the same. It's the same thing. If you if you look at it and you read it into it, it's different words. Mm -hmm. This is Old Testament. Yeah. But David did not retaliate. Yeah. So that uh, that it's you know, do not pay repay evil for evil. That's right. You know, um, don't get even. Um, and forgiveness. Yeah. Forgiveness is huge. It is, especially and, under uh, the old covenant. Wow. We we do need the forgiveness, and to realize that that God is God alone. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's going to get his way. Yeah. So. Absolutely. That was my big. <laughs> well, that's good. Those are the, those are some of the major things I really wanted us to get out of it. You're absolutely right. Yes. So, uh, and thank you, God. I tell you, ever since I've, I've come to terms with God's sovereignty, which I still, I know there's a lot more that I need to know than I, than I, what I do know, but what little bit I have embraced and come to know up to this point, boy, I tell you what, it has sure freed me from a lot of things that otherwise I would have been concerned, disturbed about, or maybe even worried about. Um, am, it, it set I, me free. I just, yeah, I just wrote down here and said, "Don't do you any good to cuss." No, nope, <laughs> and throw no, and right. throw his defense. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You know, I, I and I've I've found also, and I'm sure you already done that. It's kind of one of the things you're kind of saying, but uh, you know, even though I don't go out of my way to hear what's going on. Um, I find that whatever I need to know uh, eventually winds up getting in front of me somehow. So kind of trusting that the Lord, and I don't, I'm not trying to turn it into a, 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 a look at me as an example because it, when it comes to that, because it's not like I asked God to do that. I probably should have, but I didn't. But he's just done it anyway, and I'm appreciative of it. So uh, if I seem to need to know it, he has a way of getting in front of me. So I don't have to go out and find it. If I need to know, he'll let me know. So, so very good. Any other thoughts, guys? Yeah, I do. And it's an observation I've, I've made uh, in watching uh, what's going on quite a bit. <clears throat> on the upside, mm -hmm. so many people are, are 
coming out and uh, declaring Jesus Christ as Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's amazing. And and, and if if nothing else is coming out of some of this crap that's going on, it's that. Mm That people are no longer silent in those areas. Mm -hmm. And um, it's just encouraging to me. it just is, and, and I think it's, it, 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 well, I just think it's a good thing. <laughs> no, you're right. No, I mean, what you're experiencing there, Pam, is the same thing that people experience who are hyper-patriotic. When they hear another person say, God bless America, or, or you know, I love America, or, you know, I would die for America, there's a certain amount of, of pride that rises up inside the heart and an association and a and uh, my heart agrees with that, that they feel. And, and I feel that too, way too, to some degree on a national level. But when believers speak up who once were silent and begin to, to you know, plant the flag in the, in the ground and say, Jesus is king on this mountain and aren't silent about it, that's the kind of thing that rises up in a Christian's heart is a sense of patriotism to our kingdom and our king. And uh, that's the way it should be. So... Uh, you're right, and and that's what something God's doing. Any, I can tell you, like I've told you before, whatever is happening in the earth, it's because God is working on His church. The church is central. The world is peripheral to the church. So anything that God is doing, He's doing because of His church, and He's getting doing it to clean her up, to get her heart where it needs to be. Any political leader we've had in this nation ever has been because of the Christians in this nation. Not because they did something right or because they did something wrong, but it was God's one of God's mechanisms to reconcile the heart of his church to where it needs to be. And uh, so, uh, very, very good. So, like, I don't know, like, I used to hear my grandma say, if it... If it wasn't for bad things, we wouldn't know how good things are. Sometimes that's true. Yeah. Or we wouldn't, we would fail to recognize it. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Great.